this uh, first part of the analysis, uh, data analysis lectures, we will be talking about model free and model based feeding. Uh, there are some other approaches as uh, Wojtek will introduce later, uh, but these are the, the two first ones. And I would like to start again with some uh, refreshment of what we talk about this last couple of days. Okay, so basically in the small angle neutron scattering, we are looking at in homogeneities in the scattering length density profile. So we have this amplitude of the form factor and we have this scattering length density profile, which is actually what we actually want to determine. So because by knowing this is where we can extract the structural information of the particles um, in, in the, of the dispersed particles or mesoscopic structure. So as I said yesterday, when we go to do an experiment, we have some experimental intensity that needs to be corrected to obtain this macroscopic cross-section, which is where this structural information is contained. And therefore from where we can get the, the, the structural parameters. So because of the Fourier transform and this uh, squared of this uh, amplitude of the form factor, what happens here is that it's not as that to obtain this uh, structural information, we cannot just apply an inverse Fourier transform because part of the negative values of this uh, of this uh, amplitude of the form factor at lo are lost. So it means that we have to reconstruct because it's not as a straightforward. So we have to reconstruct and that's what we do during the, we have to reconstruct this uh, scattering density profile. And that's what we do in the, in the part of the data analysis, okay? So basically we can use a small angular scattering to prove the structures between one and a few hundred nanometers. Uh, and it's important to be in the right Q range, as I said yesterday. And then there are some important concepts about the composition of our sample in terms of contrast and deuteration. So we actually have to uh, keep that in mind when we plan the experiment and also when we are going to analyze the data, okay? When it comes to uh, this momentum transfer vector or the scattering vector, I just want to remind you that this is a function of the scattering angle and uh, the wavelength of the radiation that we are using for this uh, scattering measurement. So basically we can use these Q vectors to standardize the region of, of interest of a given experiment. So anything that we measure with SACs and SANS and the, uh, the features uh, the structural features will appear at the same Q value, okay? And uh, if we apply Bragg law to this equation and substitute this scattering angle and this wavelength, we see that this uh, Q vector is actually uh, a measurement of the reciprocal space, okay? So it's, uh, it's inversely related to the reciprocal space, which means that if we want to look at the small features in our system, we have to go at high Q. If we want to look at uh, large features in our system, we have to go to low Q. For example, if we want to see the entire orange, we will have to go to low Q, okay? And finally, uh, the scattering length density profile, it's a parameter that's used to quantify the scattering power ensemble of atoms. It's very handy when it comes to a small angle scattering, uh, to small angle scattering analysis because it simplifies the problem, and it's important to remind you that, uh, to remember that this, uh, there is a difference between the neutron and X-ray uh, scattering length because the radiation interacts in a different way with the, uh, with, uh, with, the, with, the ma with matter. So basically what happens here is that we have a linear dependence for X-rays where there is, where there is a random variation for uh, neutrons, which is also isotope dependent. So we have here uh, deuterium and proteum. So we can see that they are different. Whereas in X-ray, they are exactly the same. Okay, so this was just like a brief reminder of what we talked about the last couple of days. So now we're gonna talk about data analysis. So I'm gonna present uh, a few different things. So the first one will be uh, the feeding algorithms and the, 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 the different algorithm that, or I mean, it's basically the, the engine that we use to optimize our, our model the resolution functions that we used to apply, uh, we not usually apply to account for the resolution of the measurement. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about a few different uh, approaches to fit the, the data. So IFT, so indirect Fourier transform is something that Wojtek will talk a bit more into detail in the next lecture. So I will not 
uh, give any details about that. And empirical models is something that nowadays is not, uh, I would say that is not widely used. So I'm just gonna present like a few of them very briefly so you can actually know what that they, they actually exist. But uh, I think that is not an approach that is uh, commonly used these days anymore. Okay. Uh, so when it comes to data analysis, there are different approaches. And basically you have to pick the one that suits your purpose, okay? Because you can gain a different level of detail, but also that involves a different level of complexity. So if you wanna get loads of detail on your data analysis, that's gonna, that's gonna, uh, in, that's going to involve like a really high complex data analysis, which is going to take time and resources and so on. So maybe if you just want to see if a protein is folded or, unf or unfolded, we don't need to go to these, for example, simulation assisted methods, because just by knowing if it is folded or unfolded, we can we can use some model free approaches that are quick and easy to perform. So basically, we don't need to go that uh, that in detail, which will save us some time. Uh, and then in between, you can find different approaches that we will treat today. So first, it's the, the algorithm for uh, optimizing the, the model and goodness of fit. So uh, basically what happens is that when you create a model, when you implement a model to fit your uh, small angular scattering data, what happens is that you have some function that uh, has a, there is a difference between the uh, between this model and your experimental data. So what you want to do is you want to use an, an algorithm that will optimize and minimize the difference between the experimental data and the, the the data from the model. So basically, this is uh, the algorithm for uh, for feeding a small angular scattering data. So normally we use uh, nonlinear square uh, least square methods, for example, uh, Levenver Mapwar algorithm. And basically this also provides a way to account for the statistical weight of each uh, Q value or intensity value. Okay, so if there is some experimental error associated to this measurement, what happens is that if the experimental error is, is bigger, it means that the the, 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 scat, the the algorithm will take this into account and it will give, let's say, less importance to that Q value or intensity value. Okay, because it's like uh, less, def less defined. So, and then uh, to account for the goodness of fit, we there are also different approaches, but one of the most common ones is to use the, the chi-square statistical parameter. So basically what this does is that this takes the intensity values from your model, which is uh, the Y theory, and compare those to these uh, intensity values from your experimental data. And it's also weighted to the square of the uh, standard deviation from your measurement. So it's a squared of the error in your measurement and divided by the number of points. So what happens here is that the smaller is the difference between your experimental data and the and the and the model, uh, the lower this chi square normalized chi square uh, value is. Okay, so basically what happens here is that when we are trying to fit improve our fitness, our uh, our fit, what we have to do is we have to get it close to zero, so minimize the value of that chi square uh, parameter. Okay. Uh, so the next thing that I uh, want to mention is about the resolution. So this is something that I've uh, briefly discussed uh, in the last couple of days. So yesterday I talked about the relevance of uh, the instrument configuration when it comes to uh, resolution. And today I'm gonna talk about how we actually use these uh, resolution values to, to to, impl to implement them in the models, okay? So as I said yesterday, this mirroring the resolution contribution from the from the experimental data is actually a very complicated procedure. So you can do it for, uh, for example, when you have a uh, slit collimated uh, instrument, like for example, a USANS instrument, I think that Andrews presented that yesterday. So then you apply this DS mirroring to get this, uh, to get like the resolution contribution deconvoluted from your data. But uh, when it comes to pinhole uh, instruments like standard SANS configuration, normally what you do is that you use some models to smear the theoretical model. 
to hunt for the experimental resolution. So what happens here is that the intensity from your model, it will be the, uh, the cross section, the scattering cross section of your particles. And it, this will be convoluted to a resolution function where Q is the Q value of, uh, of each of the points. Uh, sorry, the average Q is the, is the Q value of each of the points. And then there is some, let's say, the spread of those Q values. So this resolution function is normally uh, uh, approximated by a Gaussian function. So basically you have your uh, Q value here uh, at zero, and then you have, let's say some Q spread around this. So basically this type of approach is used to calculate the, the DQ divided by Q. So the resolution of, uh, of each of the, of the Q points. And then we apply that to our uh, theoretical model. And in that way, we account for the, um, for the resolution of the measurement. So there was a question a couple of days ago about how we can do this for different uh, uh, models, uh, for different data that comes from different techniques or instruments. So for example, when we use SACS, we normally have a super good resolution because CCD cameras have a super good resolution. And also in X-rays, you can really define well, the wavelength that you're going to use for your measurements. So it means that our resolution is going to be very good. So normally you don't even apply a resolution function for X-ray measurements. But when it comes to neutrons, you have to apply this resolution function because there is a significant difference between the resolution uh, in the resolution between different instruments and even between different instrument configurations. So it's important that when we go to, for example, core find these two data sets, when it comes to X-rays, we don't even apply this resolution function, but when we go to uh, set up the parameters to, to, uh, to analyze the sense data is when we actually uh, apply this resolution function. So basically we will have like different, uh, com different approaches to fit different data that comes from uh, instruments with uh, different resolution. I will also talk briefly about that later. Okay, so this is something that you have to keep in mind when you are feeding a small angle neutron scattering data. And as I said, normally when they send you the data, and we're gonna see that tomorrow, uh, when they send you the reduced data, we have always a column, not always, but we very often have a column that has these resolution values. And then when we put this, sorry, when we put this in the, in the software, this software will already calculate this resolution function and implement it to your model. So, uh, and now I'm going to start to present the different fitting approaches starting with the most simple ones, which is model free fitting. So uh, these model free approaches normally are a good starting point for the data analysis uh, because they provide a rapid characterization of the sketcher and, and they are pretty useful because they don't assume you don't need to know anything about this. I mean, basically you can just go there, put something in the beam, time, in the beam line, and then measure something and you can apply some of these approaches to, to that data without having, for example, no structural information. So this comes handy when, for example, you have to do like a rapid assessment of, of your data to see if, for example, some particles are aggregating or they are interacting and so on, okay? So the first one is the scattering invariant. And what happens here is that we are gonna calculate the integrated scattering cross section. So basically we are going to calculate the total signal that comes out from a measurement. And this is because Ponot realized many years ago that the total signal was independent of the distribution of the inhomogeneities in our system. So for example, if we have a system that has an 80% uh, matrix, 20% particles, is uh, so the total signal will be independent on how this uh, density in, hom in, in homogeneities in the density are distributed. Okay, so basically we can use this approach to calculate the volume fraction of particles. Uh, you have to be aware that this requires uh, data in absolute scaling, so it has to be reduced using the protocols that I explained yesterday. And uh, it's, it's a very simple approach that you can use to calculate the volume fraction of particles without really knowing nothing about the structure of those. So the next one, uh, a common approach is to use the put out exponent. So put out a very smart guy, realized that the signal at high Q arise 
from the interfacial scattering. And basically what he, uh, what he found out was that for, uh, for defined interfaces, the scattering at high Q was always proportional to the Q to the minus four. And this is like the, the Porot's law. So basically what happens here is that uh, you can then take this idea and generalize it for different types of interfaces. And we have here some like uh, graphical explanation of this. So basically if you apply a logarithm in, in both of these, uh, both sides of the equation, what happens here is that you have the logarithm of intensity is equal to the logarithm of this uh, parameter that relates to the surface to volume ratio. We have the Perot exponent and then we have the logarithm of Q. And what happens here is that if we plot our data at high Q in this form, and we calculate the slope of that uh, scattering data, we'll get this product exponent. And for example, if this product exponent opponent has a value of minus one, it means that we are gonna have uh, a 1D scatter. So it's gonna be something that is very long and very thin. And it's the same for a minus two is gonna be a 2D object for like a 3D object is gonna be a minus four. Uh, and then if you have different types of like polymer networks, for example, uh, you will have different exponents that relate to the to the behavior of that polymer in solution. So it com it comes quite handy to when it, when it comes to to evaluating the uh, the scattering data, for example, from polymer systems or from particle systems. Um, so the next one is uh, the Guinier plot. So uh, what Guinier what Guinier realized was that. Uh, the low Q data could, describe, could be used to describe uh, the size of the scattering particle independently of the morphology of this particle. So basically this is the, the, Guinier, uh, the Guinier approximation. What happens here is that we have this I of zero, which is the scattering signal at angle zero. And then we have this radius of variation. And basically by plotting the natural logarithm of the intensity versus Q square, we can calculate the radius of these particles from uh, the slope of that curve of that scattering signal. Okay, so uh, the validity of this uh, Guinean approximation is uh, always uh, restricted to, to Q multiplied by the ratio of duration has to be smaller than 1.3. So I will ask you, in normal conditions, I will ask you why, uh, if someone is brave enough to, to write it in the, in the chat, it would be welcome, but there is a hint here in these two pictures, okay? So I give you like a couple of minutes to think about it uh, and then write something in the chat if you, if you want, okay? So uh, and in the meantime, I'm gonna continue by showing this, for example, by taking some data, and just uh, plot it. Uh, some, for example, a polymer that is behaving as a Gaussian coil, which is this red curve, or some spheres, which is this blue curve. What happens here is that you can see that the Guinea region, which is this one here, and with the where the size information of the particle it's in, it's contained, uh, basically is the same, even if the if a polymer. Uh, with a, that behaves such a Gaussian coil has a different structure to a sphere. So basically this was what we now realized. And then if we put it in the linear form, we see that we have this linear region here that overlap because basically the radius of variation of those particles are the same, but the structure is different. Okay, I see that no one has actually dared to write it in the chat. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna give you the answer. Uh, so what really happens is that Guinier is useful when you actually measure the Q range where you are looking at the Guinea region. Okay, there are something in the chat. Just a guess, but like if you have Q squared, RG squared, then they, mm -hmm. oh wait, I, I was thinking like if Q is 1.3, but that's Q times RG. Yeah. I, so I, mean, I was thinking about, up like uh, to the fourth, and I get like three, then my E will be like, now I'll get E to something below one, and then I will have a decreasing intensity. But now I'm I, trying I mean, to I, do just a guess. I, I, see, yeah. 
I, I see your reasoning, but I think yeah. it's, it's, but it's, I, I don't think it's where, where my mathematics is not right. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it's way more simple than that. So what happens here is that basically uh, this Q multiplied by R of G will give you the limit where, uh, where you are actually seeing the entire particle. Okay, so if you remember about this approximation using Bragg's equation in the Q, uh, in the momentum transfer equation, there is this uh, relationship that says that Q is somehow proportional to the inverse of the distance of the, of the correlation distance in your system. So this means that if we are in a regime where Q multiplied by R of G is above 1.3, we are gonna be in this situation. So the measurement that we are actually taking is not containing the, the entire particle. So we are taking a picture that is very close to, for example, the interface of this particle, but we are not seeing the entire particle. So we, can, we cannot actually say how big that particle is because it's not included in the picture. Okay, so basically this Q multiplied by RNG is telling you that the particle, it's the entire particle, it's inside your picture. So you can use this approximation. Uh, so this is like a common way of checking that uh, the, the Guinier region is, 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 is valid. Uh, the Guinier approximation is valid. Okay, this is just some square showing where the Guinier region is. So the, the Guinier plot is useful for, uh, for, uh, for getting some information on, on term, in terms of size of your particle, but it's also very useful for checking the, the, the some, for like some quick check, quick assessment of the behavior of your sample. So for example, if you have some structural factor contribution, what happens here is that at low Q, we will see a deviation from the linear, uh, so it will not be linear anymore. So the low Q data will not be linear anymore in the linear uh, form, in a linear plot. So we see here, for example, that when we have interacting particles, this intensity drops at low Q. And when we have uh, particles that are attracting each other, for example, aggregating, we have this upturn. So if we have, for example, a, a uh, a system with particles that are prone to interact, we can use this approximation to see if they are in the dilute regime where they don't interact with each other, for example. Okay, so it's, it's just like a quick way to check this. Uh, so then we have this uh, Kratky plot, which is basically uh, an, an, a, it's, it's something similar to what, uh, to, so it's something derived from Perot law. So Perot realized that this uh, Q to the minus four dependence applied for, uh, for these uh, uh, defined interfaces. And this was like generalized. And basically a random coil will have a Q to the minus two, a Gaussian coil will have a Q to the minus Q, uh, Q, to the minus two dependence at high Q. So someone said, okay, so if we multiply the side of Q by Q to the minus two, and we have a Gaussian coil, we'll have a plateau at high Q. And then, they realize that actually you can use this to assess how uh, uh, that you can assess, you can use this for a quick assessment of how this uh, let's say polymer was behaving in solution or a protein or whatever. So if we have a Q to the minus two dependence, it means that we have a Gaussian coil or a random coil. So it's for example to say that this is unfolded, and if we have something that follows this type of behavior, it's is, is globular. So basically you can use this for a quick assessment of uh, the folding state of a protein, for example. So this is some kind of like qualitative assessment. So uh, the next type of analysis, it's useful uh, when you have peaks in your data. I have a disclaimer here, which is that small angle neutron scattering is not great for studying periodic structures because we have a resolution limitation. And if we have a resolution limitation, it means that uh, the lower is the resolution, the more smear uh, will be these peaks and the more difficult will be to identify them uh, and, uh, and to find out where they are, okay? But you, get, you can still find some peaks uh, in SANS data, even more if you use like an instrument with a super good resolution or a configuration with a super good resolution, but this is normally performed you've seen a small angle X-ray scattering. So basically what happens here as, as you do in crystallography, the peak position relates to the DS spacing in a crystal structure. Okay, so we have this, again, you've seen the Bragg's law and this uh, Q vector equation. 
you can see that the Q max, so the intensity of the peak with, uh, with a lowest Q and the maximum intensity is inversely proportional to the, to the correlation length of that system, in this case, to the D spacing. And then you can use the Miller indices as you do in the crystallography to calculate the lattice structure in reciprocal space. So for example, if you have a lamellar, it's gonna be a one, two, three, four dependence. So if we have, yeah, for example, I think that this is a lamellar phase. So basically what happens here is that the first peak is going to appear at a Q somewhere around 0 0.05. The second peak is going to appear at a Q of uh, two multiplied by the first peak, by the position of the first peak and so on. So we get, we see that this peak is around 0 0.1. This third peak is going to be around 0 0.15 and so on. And then if we have an hexagonal phase, uh, we see that there is another dependence and we can actually use this, uh, the, the the lattice structure to calculate the position of these Miller indices and, uh, and where these peaks are gonna show up, okay? Uh, so if someone has any questions about this type of analysis, uh, I, I don't have time to go into lots of detail of each of them, but I will be happy to discuss them more in detail if someone uh, wants to think about them. Okay. So this part is the empirical models. And again, I will not spend much time into this because I think that the next part is more interesting and important, but I want you to be aware that this thing is a possibility and you can actually use it to, to study, uh, to extract the structural information from your, from your system. So empirical models were developed to describe uh, some trends that were observed in the small angle scattering data uh, they are relatively simple because they are not as complex as, uh, as for example, uh, model based analysis, uh, but they are slightly more complex than the, than the ones that I've presented before. So there are different ones. I have included some slides here that you will have so you can check them, but I'm not going to spend too much time. I just want you to, I just want you to understand how this works. So. For example, the correlation length model, what people realize is that the plot equation, for example, was good to describe, the plot was good to describe the behavior of polymers. And the linear was uh, good to describe the, the, sorry, the plot was good to describe the behavior of polymers. So basically what they realize is that by having an equation that includes this uh, plot law here, a product equation here with this product exponent, they could extract information from, for example, uh, polymer systems. And, uh, and basically here is that you fit your data to this type of model and you get different parameters. Uh, uh, so for example, C relates to the surface to volume ratio, so the interfacial scattering. Then we have this product exponent that relates to the behavior of that polymer. And then we have some correlation length that give us information about the size of that system. So this is basically a quick way to assess uh, the scattering from polymers. Uh, and then we also have a similar approach for peaks where we can fit the position of the peaks when we have uh, periodic structures in our data. Uh, we have uh, something that is something in between to the contour, uh, to the correlation left model and to the Gaussian peak model because we can fit uh, systems that are so we can fit like uh, the scattering from uh, systems that contain particles that interact. So it's something in between uh, these uh, periodic structures and particular systems. And, and so there are some different ones and you will have this to, 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 to have a look at if you are interested, but I'm gonna get into the more uh, interesting part uh, that is the model based analysis. So basically this model based analysis uses uh, mathematical models that have been developed to calculate the scattering from different equations. So in the same way that we know that the scattering cross section uh, is related to the, to the scattering and length density in the, uh, distribution in the system to the Fourier transform of the scattering and length density of the system, we can actually develop mathematical models that uh, calculate the Fourier transform of those uh, scattering length density distributions. So basically we can develop uh, models that describe the shape, describe the, uh, that calculate the scattering from different, uh, from different structures. 
So in these models, uh, there is going to be different variables that describe the shape of uh, of the of the scattering. So for example, you can have radius and uh, and things like that, and uh, like thicknesses, uh, lengths, or whatever. It depends on what you are investigating. And uh, and there are two different types of of models. So the first the first one is the form factor, as what they describe your day. This relates to the shape of a scatter. So we have a sphere is going to have a given form factor. If we have uh, uh, if we have uh, an, an, an ellipsoid, it's going to have a different form factor. And then we have the structural factors, which basically describe uh, interaction between the different particles. And it, there is something important here, which is that it's good to have some preliminary information about the, about the, about the scatter, either something that relates to the size or the shape. So sometimes doing uh some uh some like rough analysis using these model free approaches or using even ist uh will be useful for selecting the appropriate model because when you have a sphere it's pretty straightforward but for example when you start to have more complex structures there is so many parameters that you can basically fit whatever scattering function you have so it's good to have some information uh, on, on what you actually have there to select the appropriate model to fit the data. So uh, just to have a brief reminder about form factor and structure factor, as I said, the form factor des describes the intraparticle scattering and therefore it relates to the shape of the particle. And then the structure factor relates to the, to the super, super lattice of these uh, particles. So how these particles are arranged in the space. So uh, if we look at this uh, uh, scattering equation, which is uh, describes the scattering from a uh, central symmetric uniform uh, spheres, what happens here is that we have uh, the form factor and the structural factor uh, that correlate to the intensity. So this is uh, the scattering axis and uh, some parameters that account for the concentration of particles. Uh, so basically, this means that the, the, this leaves the form factor and the structure factor as the, as the Q-dependent functions, okay? Uh, this is valid, as I said, for a sphere, but I just want you to have a, 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 an idea of how this, uh, these different parameters affect the scattering equation. So there is a convolution of these two terms. And, uh, and, but this idea can be generalized for more complex uh, structures, but this is just like the simplest possible equation. So in terms of form factors, you have uh, different, uh, you can calculate the scattering from different structures, as I said. So for example, this is how the scattering looks from a cylinder and ellipsoid and a sphere. Basically, as you can see here, uh, the, for example, the cylinder will have two linear regions. We'll have one at low Q, one at high Q, because then let's say that there are two correlation lengths, one correlation length that relates to the length of the cylinder and one correlation length that relates to the size of that cross section. Whereas for example, the sphere has only one linear region that correlates to the diameter or radius of the sphere. So there is only one correlation length that is required to describe that shape. And as you can see, by playing with the different models, you get different scattering signals. And another thing that you can obviously do is you can play with the parameters that are used to calculate the to calculate the scattering from from that model. So, for example, here is just a cylinder that has different lengths. Okay, so you can see that this is going to be a short cylinder and this is going to be a long cylinder. And as you can see here. The short that this long cylinder, we don't even have this plateau at low Q because we are not getting to, to low Q. Uh, so the experiment that we have performed is not going to, is not reaching the Q mean required to see that second Guinea region. Okay, so by playing with the different parameters, you can see how this, uh, this function changes. Uh, tomorrow we are going to go a bit more into detail, uh, but I just wanted you to know that there are different types of, uh, of structural uh, models uh, with different parameters, and then we can build uh, models of different uh, complexity. So this is just a screenshot of, uh, of a review by uh, Jan Scott Pedersen on uh, different uh, structural models for the small angular scattering data analysis. So this is just a very few of them. 
And as you can see, there are things from very simple, very simple shapes like the sphere to very complex stuff like uh, poly, poly dispersed star polymer with, with Gaussian statistics or star polymer with Gaussian statistics and so on. And as you can see, when you get when you increase the, the complexity, you get more and more parameters in the in these models. Okay. So uh, the next the, the, the other type of models uh, are the, the structural factors. So basically these are mathematical models that describe interaction between particles. So when you have many particles in solution, if they are not interacting, if you have an in dilute regime, you're not going to have a contribution to the scattering. So S of Q is going to be equal to one and our form factor will directly relate to the, to the scattering, to the, to, the, to the experimental scattering. But then when we start to increase, for example, the concentration, what happens is that the particles start to sense each other and they start to interact with each other. So there is some kind of like uh, supraparticle supra arrangement. And then is where we start to see this, uh, that when S of Q is different to one, and as we can see, this is the form factor, this is the structure factor, and our experimental data will be a convolution of those two contributions. Uh, there are different types of interaction between particles in a, in a matrix. So we can have, uh, for example, some uh, electrostatic interactions, or we can have some hard sphere, uh, purely excluded volume uh, interactions, and, and they will affect the data in a different way. So again, this red curve is our form factor. And then if we apply some hard sphere interactions, some excluded volume effects, we see that there's gonna be a change in the scattering signal. And then if we have the same particles that are interacting through electrostatics, we see that it will affect the scattering in a different way. So we will need different models developed for, uh, for different type of interactions. And then there are also some, uh, these are for uh, repulsive potentials. But there are some attractive, uh, some, some models for attractive potential that describe, for example, coalescence of, or aggregation or uh, sticky uh, interactions. Okay. So as I said, one of the main contributions to this structural factor is uh, is the concentration, because the more particles we have in solution, the more prone will be to interact. So, for example, if we have our form factor here, which is the same for all of the particles in the, let's say. Uh, whole concentration regime, and then we start to implement different uh, structure factor model. Uh, so basically, we have the same structure factor model, which is a higher sphere repulsion, but at different volume fractions. We start to see that if we are at the at the dilute regime, it will be no difference between the form factor and 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 so it will be a direct relationship between the form factor and your scattering data. But as soon as we start to implement these uh, these uh, different structure factors, we are going to see how this affects the data in a different way. So there is going to be, for example, the appearance of a peak a high Q, and uh, there is going to be a drop in the intensity at low Q. So this is something that is characteristic of uh, repulsive interaction potentials. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly say that uh, most of these potentials are determined for uh, spherical particles because the spherical particles are relatively simple to to. So there is like uh, not many ways of interacting, let's say, because they are spherical. Uh, but as soon as you start to have an isotropy in the system. There's, there has, I mean, there's going to be correlations between the orientation of the particles, the position of those particles. So everything, everything becomes very, very complex, and it's very difficult to uh, to derive this and calculate it analytically. So basically, what we do is that we apply some different type of approximations that will calculate the interaction for particles that present certain degree of anisotropy. So there are different ones for different purposes. So for example, the coupling approximation is for uh, polydispersed and anisotropic particles, and the random phase approximation is for uh, for polymers that interact. And we can see here, for example, that this is the mathematical form of this uh, the coupling approximation. So here we have our structure factor, and it's uh, it's like let's say 
modify by this beta approximation that relates to the amplitude of the form factor of the particle. Okay, so this is an approximation that we use to simplify the calculation of, of, of this scattering uh, arising from the from interparticle interactions. Okay, so the next thing uh, that I'm gonna very briefly mention uh, is that everything that I have said until now applies to 1D data analysis. So that means that when we look at our scattering data in the detector, our intensities in the detector, there is no anisotropy. And that's because the particles are randomly oriented and we are getting like an average of all of the different, uh, like different uh, alignments or uh, uh, in, in the system, okay? So then we have this, uh, this uh, isotropic scattering. And what happens is that we calculate the radial average of this and we get the 1D data. What happens sometimes is that, for example, when we have uh, mag uh, magnetic particles and we apply a magnetic field or we have some elongated particles and apply shear, is that the scattering becomes anisotropic because particles start to, for example, align. So we have some alignment. And when we try to measure that, there is go there's going to obviously be some preferential orientation for the particles. And that shows us some uh, anisotropy in the scattering too. So there is a way to fit this using a 2D fitting. And basically what this does is that this uses some uh, form factors that account for the orientation of these particles uh, uh, in relation to the Q vector, okay? So basically what happens here is that we have this alpha, uh, alpha this uh, sign of alpha that is basically saying how these particles are oriented uh, in relation uh, to the to this Q vector, okay. So we can actually use this to analyze and to look at uh, to analyze uh, data from anisotropic systems, and to to for example look at the alignment of particles under shear or under the magnetic fields. Uh, yeah, this is something like that is not very common, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. Um, so uh, in the last part of the lecture. Uh, what I'm gonna give you is some tips that I've been gathering uh, in the in the last few years that I've spent analyzing the small angle neutron scattering data. So uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, the main expertise of my supervisor was the small angle scattering data. But as a PhD student, I had to do all the work. So basically, I had to fit all of the data. So during my PhD and uh, uh, postdoc and uh, and also my my stage as a researcher, I have been analyzing lots of uh, small angular scattering data, uh, mainly small angular neutron scattering data. So now I have some kind of a strategy that works for me. It doesn't mean that it's the best. It doesn't mean that it's gonna work for everyone. It's just what I do. But if you if you want to, 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 to maybe you can use these tips and these suggestions to kind of like uh, build your own approach, okay? So the first thing that I do when I take some small angle scattering data is that I look at the different uh, features that appear in the, in the data. So for example, I look if we have some rack peaks, which will basically tell me that we have some periodic structure, some crystal structure in the mesoscopic scale. I look if we have some bumps at high Q, which will relate to the presence of a structure factor contribution. So for example, if I look at this red, I will think, okay, I'm pretty sure that I can analyze this using just some uh, form factor model. But for example, if I have this, this peak here or this bump here, I know that I will need to apply some, um, some kind of a structure factor model in, uh, that is convoluted to the form factor. So other things that I do is, for example, look at the presence of Guinean regions. So as I said before, if we have something that is spherical or close to spherical, we're gonna have one Guinea region, as we can see in this yellow one here. But as soon as we start to have uh, more elongated objects, what happens is that we start to have two different correlation lengths to describe those objects. And therefore we have two Guinea regions, one at high Q that relates to the cross section, uh, and one at low Q with relates to the length of this particle. So basically that's telling me already something in terms of the structure of this, that there are two different correlation lengths to describe these particles. And a useful tool actually is to normalize the data. 
Okay, so for example here, this data is normalized to the concentration of, of, of this fact. And normally the best way to normalize the data is to the volume fraction of particles, because that's how, what we do when we do present the data in absolute scaling. We have the data normalized in absolute scale to the volume fraction of particles. Okay, so basically by 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 uh, dividing this data uh, by the volume fraction of particles we have there that we can, for example, calculate uh, theoretically if we know how, for example, much how many particles or how uh, yeah how much protein or whatever we put in in the system, we can calculate the expected. Uh, volume fraction and normalize everything. So there will be some kind of like information here. So for example, here I can see that there is an overlap. We're measuring different concentration. There is an overlap at high Q and there is differences at low Q. So this is telling me that the high Q feature, in this case, the cross section is not gonna change with concentration, but there is a change with concentration in the in the low Q signal. So there's a change in concentration in, the, in this, uh, let's say, uh, large features in the in the in the system okay and that's just uh, about the presence of peaks so then something that i uh, also uh, normally do is to use some uh, some standard plots and some model free analysis to do a quick evaluation of the data and uh, and, and what happens here is that i normally use porot for example if i'm looking at uh, polymer systems to get some information on the slope at high q or, uh, or for example, if I have like some, uh, yeah, hierarchical structure, like in a, for example, a cylinder, we have this cross section and then we have this elongation. So there is gonna be different features that can be analyzed with this uh, pour out plot that will give us information about the shape. And then Guineer plot, as I mentioned before, is good to, for example, determine if we have some structural factor contribution in our system. And as you can see, so if there is no interaction, it's perfectly linear at low Q, if we have some uh, uh, repulsive potential, there's gonna be a drop in the intensity. If we have some attractive uh, potential, there's gonna be an increase in intensity. So we can use this to quickly evaluate the presence of, of this type of interactions. And the cracky plot, as I said, can be used as a qualitative way of looking at the folding state of, of, of a particle or of a polymer or of a protein. Okay, if it is globular, it's gonna show this IQ dependence, if it is unfolded or if it is like a Gaussian change, is going to show this, this IQ behavior that has some kind of plateau IQ. So then when I do that, I already have some structural information that I can use for selecting some models that might be suitable to analyze the data. So basically what I do is I pick one contrast that has uh, uh, full contrast. So, for example, is uh, some proteated particles in deuterated uh, matrix. So, in that way, we have the biggest difference in the in the scattering axis. And then I just use this to to try some simple models and and see how they are how good they are feeding the data. So, as you can see here, we have three different particles that have different three different structures, and I try to use uh, monodispersed ellipse, so it's polydispersed ellipse, so it's monodispersed spheres, polydispersed spheres, and cylinders. And as you can see, for example, when we get to this blue signal, we can see that this, uh, this uh, mo sphere model uh, is not good at all to analyze the data uh, at low Q. And if we go to high Q, we see also that, the, that, that some models are better at feeding the data. And a useful tool to analyze uh, this data often is to check the chi-square values, because some of these models might look very similar when we visually inspect them, but there is going to be some large differences in terms of chi-square, so in terms of goodness of fit. So normally the goodness of fit is a good assessment to decide which model is best to analyze this data. Okay, so then the third part will be to try to use some uh, mathematical models to, to fit the data, okay? So then what happens is that we, we, we want to think about how our particle is gonna behave in solution. Is it gonna be just a nanoparticle that is totally uniform? Are we gonna have some kind of like core structure or different uh, shells? Uh, 
or are we going to have some complex interface in which the scattered intensity profile is not like these stairs or these steps that is basically, yeah, this is a well-defined interface or we have more like, uh, like interfaces that are not that well-defined. So then we can pick more uh, complex models to fit the data. So we can pick, for example, these uh, coarsial structures or vices or nano disk or things like that. But we have to actually think about what we expect uh, in terms of a structure to kind of like select uh, more complex models. So it's important that at the beginning and uh, when you can, it's important to actually look at the scattering in the dilute regime, because in that way we will only need to use a form factor and we can neglect the structure factor contribution, but this is not always the case. So sometimes we will have to then implement the structure factor to look at the interaction with different particles. So for example, here, I'm including this uh, hard sphere structure factor to look at how uh, this, uh, this affects the, the, the scanning data, okay? And as I said before, uh, often, uh, it's easy to get a model to go through your uh, experimental data, but that doesn't mean that it's a good fit because sometimes you have so many parameters that basically you can get anything, any model to fit almost any data. So as I said uh, a couple of way, or a couple of days ago, a good way to get around this limitation is by using different contrast and by combining different techniques, for example, SANS and SACS, or by using different uh, isotopic uh, labeling in our uh, SANS data. So for example, here I'm looking at some kind of like core shell structure. And what I did is I took three measurements uh, that was, one was resolving the entire particle, the other one was resolving the shell, and the other one was resolving only the core. And by feeding these three, by simultaneously feeding these three to the same model, we can get a very robust answer on what is the structure that we are actually studying. And this is the last step that I will follow. So once I've decided which form factor is gonna fit the data, which structure factor is gonna count for into particle contribution, so I have a clear idea of how the particle will look like, then is when I come and try to simultaneously fit uh, all of the data. So sometimes you might get a good answer, sometimes you might not, so you might have to come back to the previous step and decide what is the what is a suitable form factor or structure factor for analyzing the data. But this is the last step that I will do. But obviously there is some uh, feedback that will go back to the previous analysis steps. And finally, what you have to do is you have to determine the error for uh, for the feeding parameters. So normally the feeding algorithm will provide you with some errors, but uh, oft, I mean sometimes these are not realistic. And, uh, and they just like deviate from like, they are just like a mathematical uh, algorithm that will give you some answer. But that doesn't mean that answer is uh, like physically realistic, for example. Uh, so just imagine that if the resolution of a science experiment is, uh, for example, plus minus one Armstrong, and you fit the data and you get a, a, an error of like 0 0.001 Armstrong, obviously your error in the determination of that structure will be larger than 0 0.001, just because the resolution of the instrument doesn't let you to go that in that level of detail. So it's important to know that sometimes the errors are not representative of what actually you are studying. Okay, so what you can do later is that you can take this, uh, this uh, data and these parameters that you calculated uh, before, and use uh, different types of algorithms to calculate the errors. So you can go from something simple like Levenberg Mapward, or you can have some kind of more complex uh, error analysis. For example, Markov change Monte Carlo analysis and so on, in which it will give you, for example, correlations between parameters, and it will give you more uh, a more robust uh, error analysis. Okay, this is the last thing. I know that there is lots of ideas and concepts here. So again, if you uh, have any question, you can ask it now. If you have more specific questions, you can always email me or ask me in, pri in the private chat. But I just want you to have some like important take home messages, which is that the analysis of neutron scattering data uh, could be often 
complex, but the level of complexity will depend on the, the purpose of your investigation. So there is no need to actually uh, spend uh, months of uh, simulation power and uh, simulation approaches if you are actually just want to see if the protein is folded or unfolded uh, in different conditions, okay? Uh, so try to avoid uh, overfeeding and spending too much time feeding the data if you actually don't need it. Uh, so uh, it's good to establish a feeding uh, strategy that works for you. Uh, as I told you, I have one that I normally follow, but you have to build your own and something that you feel comfortable with and you can optimize to be uh, quite good and proficient at doing it. Uh, and then there are some like useful links that you might uh, want to use. So uh, for example, for the data analysis uh, of the SANS and SACS data using model-based feeding, you have software like SASView, which is the one that we're gonna use tomorrow. There are other options like SASFIT uh, for the data analysis of uh, using the IFT method and that uh, uh, what tech will present later, you have software like AdSAS and BioISIS. And for uh, simulation-based feeding, you have uh, different platforms like Rosetta and SASE and things like that, that they do different things uh, to calculate the, the, the scattering profile. Then you have some uh, links to SLD calculators and SLD calculators for uh, proteins. Uh, you have like a booklet of all of the neutron scattering lens and cross-section at the NCNR website. And again, the SANS toolbox is always a good uh, go-to uh, resource to look at, uh, at the different uh, different aspects on data analysis and also on experimental science. That, as I said, it basically contains everything. So this is all for me today. And if you have any questions, you can ask them to me now in the chat, or you can email me later if they come back to your mind when you are looking at the slides in the future. And uh, thank you very much for your attention, guys.